Welcome, willing workers, to our second lesson from the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll continue this uh, study of this book through the month of August. So uh, today we, uh, in our second lesson, have a lesson coming from chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. The title of our message today is, What Time Is It? And uh, I've added just a few verses to our uh, already lengthy verses for the day. We'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 22 today. Our theme of our lesson is the wise person stewards his time, realizing that God controls all things. That'll be interesting because that is so true uh, that we are merely stewards of everything that God has given us. There is nothing that we own outright because God is the one who created everything, including us. And so uh, the theme of this lesson should be a apparent as we read through the verses. Let's start uh, verse 1, see what the preacher has to say this time. He begins by saying, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter <clears throat> under the sun. Remember now this phrase, under the sun, means this earthly life. Preacher goes on, he says, these are familiar uh, verses to most all of us. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil, asks the preacher. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, God has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for men than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from what God does. God has done it so that people fear before God. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, 
I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. The, a man has no advantage over the beasts in this regard, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. <clears throat> Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him? to see what will be after him. <clears throat> In our society today, it is considered to be a postmodern society, and skepticism seems to be the uh, uh, feeling of the day. Everybody is uh, skeptic, and uh, you'll hear uh, phrases being used like, right now counts not at all. Or right now counts only for right now. Christians must be different than skeptics. We cannot be skeptics and love Jesus as a Christian. There is a God in heaven who will bring everything we have said, everything we have thought, and everything we have done into judgment, a, a just judgment. And he will render a verdict on all of that. He has entrusted and given that authority to his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. When speaking of forever, a time reference is made. When is forever? You know, uh, the biblical understanding of time is key here in Ecclesiastes' message throughout the book. <clears throat> Many ancient cultures thought that a cyclical understanding of time was proper. And the religions that were brought forth from that uh, especially today, a lot of the Eastern religions hold this view of time being cyclical and that you live and you die and you come back again in some other form. You live and you die and you come back again in some other form. You know, the cyclical view says that, uh, that time is a recurring loop that has no beginning and no end. History somehow gets started goes through its cycle of events and ends and starts again and I'll add infinito is how this cycle goes. If time though is a cycle, we are stuck in a pattern that allows us for no advance and no final evaluation. No transcendent meaning is possible in such a scenario as a cyclical time. On the other hand, the scriptures present time to us that we live in as a linear view. 
there is a definite beginning to history, and that is the creation that God started. And all things are moving to a final point when the kingdom of Christ our Lord will be consummated and God will be all in all. We can read about that in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 28. This view of time allows for a real change and a real advancement of each individual that lives in it, all under the watchful eye of our sovereign God. And uh, God has determined a time and a purpose for everything that happens. That is the point of the preacher's message today that we have read. There is a time to be born and a time to die. Each of us has a date when we were born. And each of us has a date, though we're alive today, we have a date in the future of time when we will die. Our Father has determined our lifespans. He has appointed a purpose for each of us. Some people don't believe that. But you can read about that in Psalm 139, verse 16. God has determined that there are times to do certain things. There are times to kill. That would be the lawful execution of force against those guilty of capital crimes. We don't do that much anymore. The cutting away of diseased flesh of the society is who and what these capital criminals are. He also says there's a time to heal. God has also declared there's a time for war against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. That war was won at Calvary. But there are still skirmishes going on because not everybody believes that the war is over. And there's a time for peace. Not with these foes in eternity, but with the Almighty through Christ's uh, redemption of us. We are reconciled with God and we have peace with God, although war rages around us and sometimes engulfs us, because God has written down history as his story, we know there is an appropriate time for all events. None of the events that God has ordained are pointless. Now, scripture is concerned with answering this question. The title of our lesson today. What time is it? The answer that it gives for the present era is that we are living in the last days. You can, Jesus himself stated that. And then the apostles in their uh, letters and their writings tell us that we are in the last days. Now, some of us think that the last days should be lasting 2,000 years, but God's time is not our time. And if Jesus himself told us we are in the last days, dear Christians, we are in the last days. And that period is when the gospel goes forth in power to bring the nations into the kingdom of God. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 tells us that. We must be focused on accomplishing this great task that we were charged with by Christ at his ascension. And it involves times of prayer for the lost, periods in which we reach out and to unsaved family and friends. Now, as we continue in chapter 3 here, let us recall that one of the emphasis of the entire book is the fleeting nature of so many things in life. 
and how we are to live in light of that reality. Things that we have today that we call ours after our death are no longer ours. We stand as we are before God Almighty when we die. It is not that we are to blindly accept the maxim that nothing lasts forever. God has put eternity into the hearts of all men and women. And we know that death does not represent the end of our human existence. We're told that in Scripture. Eternal life in the blessed presence of God or eternal death in the lake of fire awaits every human being. And I appeal to those who may not know Jesus as their Savior and Lord to do so while there is still time. Revelation 20 and 21 tells us about that differentiation between those who live in the pre blessed presence of God and those who reside in the lake of fire eternally. Nevertheless, it is true that pleasure this side of glory is sometimes fleeting for us. What is here today may be gone tomorrow. Today we might be in great health. Tomorrow we could be diagnosed with a terminal case of cancer. Today might be a day of feasting. Tomorrow we might lose our jobs and know what it means to suffer a lack of things. We cannot hold on to anything except our Redeemer and Lord Jesus Christ. And it is also good to know that he holds on to us and he never lets go, though we may from time to time let go for various reasons. Now, our verses today present the reality through a series of couplets that show uh, that there is both a time for one thing and a time for another. That's what we had in the first eight verses. Uh, and uh, though we laugh today, a tragedy can soon turn our laughter into mourning. There is even a proper time for love and a proper time for hate. Today, one's country may be at war and there is always a war going on somewhere among the nations of this earth but the fighting will not last eventually there will come a peace the cessation of armed conflict between two powers such realities make life finally pointless if there is no god for there is nothing anyone can do to break this cycle but for those who know their duty to fear God and keep God's commandments, these realities point us to the one who does give meaning to life, that's Jesus Christ. We can enjoy the good and be comforted in the bad because we know that the Lord is in control and not some impersonal fate that we may have or suffer. God will sustain us, bringing every secret thing under judgment, rewarding his own people in Christ, condemning those who reject the Savior. There's a com commentator of the scriptures from uh, around the 1500s, and he comments that those things which to us seem most casual and contingent are, in the counsel and foreknowledge of God, punctually determined, and the very hour of them is fixed, and can neither be anticipated by humans, nor adjourned a moment too soon. The Lord has appointed times and seasons for all things. He can therefore be trusted 
if he has done that, and he has, we can be trusted to guide us through them to our final glory. Now, it has been noted that you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. Moving, moving trucks do not follow people to the grave. For there is nothing that we own in this life that we take with us when we die. That is why we must hold on to our things very loosely. There will come a time when we have to give them up. If we are not in a right relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and do not share his eternal perspective, we will be unprepared to let go when we need to let go. God is eternal. We are not. It's been said that there are only two things in life that are certain. And those are death and taxes. Now that's darkly humorous, but we do feel the looming inevitability of time's steady march. It was only yesterday that I was a teenager and enjoying life, or so I think. And I'm sure many of you have the same feeling. There is no escaping the steady march. Though we spend millions each year attempting the feat. How many dollars are spent on Botox treatments? How many dollars are spent on cosmetics? How many dollars are spent for hair transplants? You know, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that we're referring to here. All of this, of course, bears testimony to the eradicable longing implanted in the human heart. And that implantation is by God, and it is eternal life. <clears throat> One of our verses, verse 11, God says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And it also says that God has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Death is a curse. It came when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and this creation became cursed. And it's something from which all people long to be delivered. We think, for example, of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus in Mark 10, 17, and he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, though we long for life, we do not turn to the living God to find it. In John 5, 39, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for searching the scriptures because they believed that in searching the scriptures alone, they had eternal life. Those very scriptures spoke of Jesus, and yet the Pharisees would not come to Jesus for eternal life. How foolish we are. God is the living God. He has life in himself. To whom else can we turn for life? Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had ever had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We get that from Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. If the attribute of infinity teaches us that God has no limits of space or power, the attribute of eternity is its perfect complement. It teaches us that God has no limits of duration or time. 
God has no beginning. God has no end. He is self-existent. And he didn't create us because he needed something. He created us for his glory. And that is the end of all mankind. To glorify God. And through his son Jesus Christ, those who believe to enjoy him eternally it is not simply that God lasts forever as though he were merely capable of enduring without end the unceasing successions of moments rather God's eternity is that he is not subject to time it's hard for us to wrap our mind around us we sit in a time bubble God sits outside of that time bubble. There is no time in God's presence. God's eternity means that he is not subject to our time. Uh, he does not move through time as we, his creatures, do. He is, God is, the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and is to come. Revelation 1 8 uh, is Jesus saying that of himself. He says he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus stands above and before everything. When the beginning for us began, God already was. When the end comes, for us, God shall endure unchanged. Now, this is true of Jesus the Christ, as it is of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. In John 8, 58, Jesus declared, Before Abraham was, I am. I am is a purposeful echo of the divine name which derives from the Hebrew verb that means to be. God is the great I am who I am. He told Moses that in Exodus 3.14. Now this means that God possesses self-existence self-independence and the power of being is within himself. He is the one to whom all things alike present, who is unconstrained by time. While creatures must all say, I was, I am, and I will become. Only God can say, I am. When we get to heaven, we will still continue to say, I was and I am. There is no becoming in God. Jesus also said in John 8.58, which teaches us about this great I am who became flesh and dwelt among us. John wrote that in chapter 1 of his book, verse 14. This means that as Hebrews 13, 8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is why he is the fountain of eternal life. We need to look no further than to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom the Father has granted to have life in himself, according to John 5, 26, that Jesus might give eternal life to all who believe in him. Now, the broad question that the writer of Ecclesiastes seeks the answer to is, is there any meaning to the time that we spend in this world? We put on a man's tombstone that he was born on a certain date, 
and that he died on a certain day. Between those two points in time, we live this life. The basic question is, does my life have meaning? A common refrain that is echoed in Ecclesiastes is that there is futility, vanity, and nothing new under the sun. If our lives begin under the sun as a cosmic accident, as some would have you believe, the result of random collisions of and mutations of inert matter, and if our ultimate destiny is to return to the dust that bore us, there can be no purpose in life. But praise God, that is not the case. And we do not need to believe such people who proclaim such things. When we cease to look under the sun and seek our destiny under heaven, we find our purpose in this life. Our origin was not in the primordial soup that some tell us began billions of years ago, but in the very hands of God Almighty, who shaped us and breathed life into us. Our destiny is not to return to dust, but to give honor and praise to the God of this universe that he created. And we will give that praise to him forever as we exist in his presence in eternity. Under heaven, we find purpose. If we have God as our origin and as our destiny, between those two points of time, there is a purpose and meaning to our life. The preacher answers the question with a resounding yes. There is a reason for our lives. There is a reason for our suffering and a reason for our pain. There is also a reason for our joy. Are you living your life under the sun or under heaven? Have you found true purpose and meaning to your life? Ecclesiastes 2.22 tells us this, For what has a man for all his labor, and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, who has saved us and called us with holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 says this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Chapter, uh, verses 19 and 20 tell us for what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. Scripture gives us the truth about God, but it is equally the case that it gives us the truth about human beings. Often the Bible does this by juxtaposing a key truth about God and a key truth about humanity. We see that in these verses, these last verses that we read. Having learned in verse 17 that a day is coming when the Creator will judge all people, we might be tempted to ask God why He ordered things this way, or even to claim that He should execute judgment right now. But we need to be careful because we learned what Job had happened to him when he questioned why the Creator is doing anything. It is not ours to question why because we are as the pot to the potter who is making it. We are but clay vessels 
that are being used by its creator. God is testing human beings that they may see that they themselves are nothing more than the beasts of the field. The seeming delay of judgment is meant to bring us to the realization that like the animals, we are mere creatures and not in control of time or the seasons for judgment. And creatures have no right to demand anything from their creator. The last verses of our lesson today assist us in developing an appropriate understanding of our place and significance in God's created order. Despite the fact that we are made in God's image and are more like him than is any other created being that God has made, we are still just that. We are created. We do not have self-existing power. And we, uh, like the animals, are made of dust. And we will return to dust. And yet we are not like the animals in every respect. This may not be plain at first for this verse, which is difficult in the Hebrew, is hard to render in English. The preacher that makes it seem as if he is uncertain about where the spirits of people and beasts go when they die. However, several commentators believe that the preacher is actually making a statement of certainty, namely that although light, humanity, and beasts go to the grave, the afterlife for each is different. In the light of the fuller new covenant revelation through Jesus Christ of heaven and hell, we have a better understanding of this afterlife. How then shall we live in light of the fact that life is fleeting? And that we will go to the grave no less than what the beast will. Well, the preacher's answer is that we should enjoy our life in the present. Given his teaching on final judgment, he is not advocating some crass hedonism when he urges us to rejoice in our work. Which in this context refers to all of life. All of life is a work. God made us that way. The preacher is calling us not to discount the present and the pleasures of God's good creation. The Lord wants us to enjoy them now, for we will leave them behind at our death. Knowing that we will die just like the animals, when viewed in the proper context, frees us not to take ourselves too seriously. Death is the great leveler, bringing the end to influence of king and commoner alike. This does not negate the importance of our decisions, though, for eternity. It does help us gain perspective on our successes and our failures. Our mistakes will not, will not derail God's plan. God knew we were going to make all these mistakes before he ever created the, the world, before he ever made his creation. Our successes should be enjoyed as gifts of God this side of eternity. They'll not follow us into eternity. But our decision to follow Christ will bring us to one eternity and not the other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word even as Ecclesiastes gives us a negative picture sometimes, we get the positive here in that you are the Savior. You're the Creator. You're the Savior. And we need to follow you, obey your commands, and love you, and love everyone in this life as you have loved them as well. Father, help us to understand this as we contemplate it throughout the week. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.